I was born to Finnish immigrant parents in 1973 in Timmins, Ontario, Canada, which is the same place as uh, Shania Twain, the country music star, is from. And um, at the age of six, I first saw pro wrestling on television in Timmins, my hometown, at a family friend's place. And I remember there was a big hulking, not Hulk Hogan, but a big hulking, muscular professional wrestler in tights standing in the wrestling ring and I was spellbound as a kid, man. I watched and I looked and it was like the superheroes come to life. And right then and there I knew this was for me. This is my thing. And since that time, I've followed wrestling religiously. Um, as a teenager growing up, I remember living in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada and my very first Saturday night's main event on NBC television, it was Hulk Hogan against Nikolai Volkov. And I was enraptured by what I saw. And I remember Saturday mornings we'd watch the UWF, the Universal Wrestling Federation, which would be on TV in Thunder Bay with my friend Vaco Wenstrom at his place, uh, along with International Wrestling from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and the WWF at the time, which is nowadays, of course, WWE. And that was when I knew that, man, if I ever could, I would want to get into the wrestling business myself. Then came the year 1992 and I moved to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And during that year of 92, it was the summer, late summer of 92, I got to know a guy called Steve DeSalvo, who was a professional wrestler in Canada. He wrestled for Gino Brito as Steve Strong and also for Stu Hart in Calgary for Stampede Wrestling as Sadistic Steve DeSalvo. And Steve was starting a new wrestling company in Calgary at the time with a guy called Beef Wellington, who was Chris Benoit's old tag team partner for Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling. And um, I thought to myself, man, what, how can I get into the wrestling business? Now, now's my chance. And I thought I was an artist, so I would offer my art skills to the promoters so that maybe they'd put my drawings of the wrestlers into the weekly programs that they, that, they, that they would then hand out at the venue to the fans. Um, that was my pitch to Steve DeSalvo when I met him. And Steve didn't see that as being the thing. What Steve heard more so was my voice. And Steve DeSalvo took a chance on me. He gave me the opportunity to become the ring announcer and TV commentator for the occasional television broadcasts of Rocky Mountain Pro Wrestling in Calgary, Alberta, Canada in the fall of 1992. That's how I got into the pro wrestling business. From that moment onward, I, got, I became friends with Chris Jericho, who was just starting his career in Calgary at the time, and with Lance Storm, who was also starting his career at the time. Uh, they had begun, I think, in 1991 or at the end of 1990. And from then on out, uh, I got trained in 93 by Lance Storm and by Carl Moffat, who wrestled as Jason the Terrible in Canada for Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling and also for Carlos Colon in Puerto Rico. I got trained by these two guys at the Hart Brothers Wrestling School in Calgary to become a pro wrestler in 93. January 7th of 1994 at the Victoria Park Civic Center in Calgary, I had my very first match against Lance Storm, a seven minute competitive match and from what I was told, that was the second best match of the night, right behind Beef Wellington versus Chris Jericho uh, later that night, which was the main event of the show. That was really an accolade, I guess, and I would have to tip my hat to Lance Storm for allowing me to shine in that match as I did. And that was my start in the wrestling business. Uh, in 1994, 95, 96, I wrestled in the US, in Canada, all across Canada. And then in the summer of 96, I moved to Finland due to a recession in the economy in Eastern Canada. I figured that I'd come to Finland, the home country of my parents, because I knew the language and I'd just wait out the recession for let's say six months, a half a year, maximum a year at most, and I'd go back to Canada. But that actually didn't end up happening. What actually did end up happening was that I ended up staying here in Finland and starting my own business four months into living here. So lo and behold, Years went by, seven years went by, 2003 rolls around, and WWE SmackDown has started a show on Finnish television on Sub TV, and 
it's drawing incredible viewership numbers right up there with Conan O'Brien is WWE SmackDown. And I saw a business opportunity. So in 2003, I started training Finnish talents to become professional wrestlers at the Klondike building in Kerava, Finland for the very first time in 2003. A Finnish set of students and a pioneering work in professional wrestling began for myself here in this country. So that group of students in 2003 was the very first batch of Finnish professional wrestlers out of which still today Stark Adder and Johnny McMetal are active. Everybody else has quit. <laughs> so there are two guys from that group which uh, are still with us. But nonetheless, I would re go on to wrestle all across Europe in the coming years until I finally made it to my country of choice, my golden grail in the professional wrestling industry, the country of Japan in 2010. That was my career goal. My career goal was never WWE, it was always Japan. In 2010, I was blessed to become a star overnight, a superstar, a nationwide, a household name in Japan overnight because a guy called Yoshihiro Tajiri, the Japanese buzzsaw, believed in me and gave me an opportunity to go and wrestle for his company, Smash, in Japan in 2010. And I had the express privilege of sitting under the learning tree with Tajiri and watching a mastermind, somebody who I would consider to be and who the Japanese consider to be a wrestling genius. It's a name given to very few wrestlers in Japan, guys like Marafuji and guys like Keiji Muto and Tajiri. Very few wrestlers have the genius tag in Japan. But Tajiri is one of them and I sat under the learning tree with, with Tajiri for the time that I wrestled for his companies, which was a four year period between 2010 and 2014. And I was Japanese champion twice during that time. And I took those lessons that I learned with Yoshihiro Tajiri. And I thought to myself that how can I better myself as both a wrestler, as a performer, and as a business owner. And in the year 2014, another Japanese gentleman named Fumi Saito, one of the most acclaimed wrestling journalists in Japan. For over 30 years, Fumi has been a journalist. He's an incredibly brilliant man who lectures at the University of Tokyo, and he's a, a teacher. He's a journalist. He's many things. He's a writer. And Fumi said to me, he said that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are leaders and there are followers. You are a leader. He said to me, you could do so much more if you wanted to with professional wrestling in the Nordics because you are a pioneer of the game in that part of the world. And I thought of his words for the years that followed. That was 2014, now we're in 2018, and they just, his words live with me. They remained in my mind, and I just couldn't shake that feeling that there's something behind what Fumi said that is true. I could do so much more. And I looked at the professional wrestling scene now in the last two years, how it's budded, how it's blossomed due to the WWE Network and how the business is doing in Germany, how it's doing in the UK. And I see these companies like Rev Pro, Revolution Pro and Andy Quilden in the UK, just incredible business. I look at guys like Joe Cabre for Over the Top Wrestling in Ireland, doing incredible, incredible business drawing thousands upon thousands of people to the events. And I look at a guy like Chris the Bambi Killer Raber in Austria, who's been one of the smartest men in professional wrestling in Europe, who's been able to make a career and make money at this, at this game that we call professional wrestling, to navigate his piece of personal piece of business in a way that generates money for himself and for those around him. And I took all of these guys and I thought to myself, what are the lessons to be learned? What can I take from this and adapt to my own piece of business? So here at the age of 45, I look at my own career and I say that I've been blessed. I've had 25 years of a hell of a career and I think to myself that guys like Nick Bockwinkel, legends like Ric Flair were able 
to wrestle past the age of 50 due to superior conditioning and knowing their trade. I wrestled Dave Fit Finlay in Japan in 2011. He was 51 years old and I was 38 and he absolutely destroyed me for 15 minutes. He ate me alive. I could not believe it. The man was in superior condition to me. And I took that example and I thought to myself, man, if I could be in the same condition as Dave Finlay at 50 years old. So I'm thinking to myself that I've got a few years left in the professional wrestling business as an active wrestler. And if there's one thing that I know, like the back of my hand, it is professional wrestling. That is why I am now spearheading and I'm starting Slam Wrestling Finland to offer people the opportunity to see the kind of wrestling, the kind of wrestlers, the kinds of performers that they want to see, the kinds of matches that they want to see. They are able to order custom tailored on demand the kinds of matches and the kinds of wrestlers male or female that they want to host and present at their events i would say this is revolutionary a guy called simon Sinek said that if you work at something that you don't care about it's called stress but when you work for something that you do care about it's called passion and what else am i going to do because really, if I think to myself, if I really think hard, pro wrestling has been my life. And from here on out, pro wrestling is my life. Slam Wrestling Finland, unlike any other, welcome on the journey with us.